Welcome to Mindfulness Manufacturing. My name is Trevor Blondiel. Spending 25 years in manufacturing, I discovered the real impact we have on turnover, communication, and the ability to manage change is how we show up. That's the essence of emotional intelligence. In each episode, we bring a guest or message to expand your skills, engage your people, and grow your organization. So let's jump in. When we work with manufacturing plants to connect the top of the shop, the Leading with Emotional Intelligence program dives into authenticity, and we discuss the ability to project calm and confidence. That's why we call the podcast Mindfulness Manufacturing. One of the examples we use in doing this right is talking about the team from Miracle on the Hudson. We use them to explain what it looks like doing it right from that event on January 15th, 2009. My good friend, Hugh Hornsbury, introduced me to Dave Sanderson, and Dave was the last passenger off U.S. Airways Flight 1549, which had to ditch into the river. Welcome, Dave. Oh, well, thank you, Trevor, for having me. Very cool. Thank you. So we talked about this, Dave, and just trying to understand, you know, what was it like on there? How did it work so well? And I've listened to some great podcasts you've been on. I've seen your awesome TED Talk. I know you've told the story more than once, but just kind of give us the the background of that experience to kick things off. Well, cool. Well, well, thank you. No worries, because, you know, it's uh, it's a little different slant every time I share it, because (laughs) here's the uh, short version. I was on a three-day business trip starting in Sarasota, Florida on that Tuesday. Wednesday, we were working in a manufacturing plant in Petersburg, Virginia. Uh, That night, we packed up, headed north to New York City, because the next day, we're going to be working in a distribution center in, in Brooklyn. So, you know, we were, and I don't know, I, some, some of your folks have probably have worked in a manufacturing environment or a distribution center, but it will open up early. This one is opened up at mm-hmm. two o'clock in the morning. So, you know, we were there to do technology checks and we wanted to see how the trucks were running, right? And the yeah. loads and everything else, because we were doing that stuff. So we got in at five o'clock. So all the trucks got done like at eight thirty, nine o'clock, right? They're on the run. Mm-hmm. So we were done by 10. So I'm like, I get to go home early. <laughs> so I gave up a first class seat at five o'clock to be on U.S. Airways flight 1549 that uh, earlier that day. And that's uh, that, that that decision definitely changed the course of my, my life. Um, I wasn't supposed to be on the plane that day. Got to the airport a little early. No big shakes. Snowing in New York. Planes delayed. Happens all the time. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you're in LaGuardia, it's <laughs> odd if the plane is on time. So, you know, no big deal. Plane takes off, and it was nothing unusual about to take off. About 60 seconds after we took off is when I heard an explosion. And I also see 15A. That's four rows behind the left wing. And when I heard the explosion, it got my attention because I never heard an explosion on a plane. So it's like, mm-hmm. you're in New York and hear an explosion? <laughs> All right, what's going on, right? Yeah. So you look out the window and see fire coming out from the left wing. So, okay, plane lost an engine. All right. You know, I I travel a lot. Stuff happens on planes. Planes got multiple engines. We're going back to the airport. Exactly what I thought. We're just going back, right? Get another plane. But no one knew at that moment what happened on the left side where we were also up on the right side at the same exact second. And I mm-hmm. think that's one of the things that I tell people. I, I think that was a moment for me. It, you know, it's, I think God's grace entered because no one knew until that moment what happened on the left side, happened on the right side. I truly believe if anybody did realize it, mm-hmm. then all of a sudden you could potentially have panic on the plane. Yeah. And all of a sudden you have people sort of losing their heads. And when people start to lose their heads, they start making bad decisions. You know, yes, we know that manufacturing plants. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so you know, I've, been, I've lived in manufacturing distribution centers. So, you know, so you got to keep your head. But, you know, as we banked, I thought we'd go back to the airport. But then I looked out the window. I saw New York City, Manhattan. It was like right out my window. I'm like, <laughs> I've never seen that one before, right? Yeah. I looked out a little further. I see this bridge coming up. and never see that before. And it happened to be the George Washington Bridge. And as soon as we start crossing over the bridge is when I heard the only words I heard the entire time. This is your captain. Brace for impact. Hmm. And that's the moment I know my I and possibly others. I know others, but say possibly <laughs> yeah. knew something was going on. Something yeah. serious is happening because, you know, he says that you're bracing for impact. Never heard that on a plane before. You look out the window and all you see is water. So you know now something something's not gonna is gonna happen. It's probably not gonna end up well. And so you know it's about a minute after we crossed over. There's a lot of I'm, I'm giving you the short version. A lot happens in between. Of course. But after he, about 60 seconds after he crossed over a bridge when he crashed into the river, and you know I've heard it called a ditch. I heard it called a water landing. Mm-hmm. I think if you talk to most passengers, they'll say it's a crash. Yeah. And the reason why is in the back of the plane where I was is where it hit first. Mm. He hit. He says he estimates he hit between 110, 120 miles an hour. 
So if you ever see anything like a NASCAR hitting the wall at 110, 120 miles an hour, it's a crash. It's a crash. It's a crash. But, uh, you know, we get down, you know, we survive that, right? Obviously look up and see wide out the window. It's like, okay, I'm alive. But now you got another problem. You got water that's coming into the plane, rushing into the plane because the back of the plane got, got severed on the impact. Water's coming in. So now where I was sitting was water was about ankle to knee deep immediately. But you're, you don't feel that. Because you got no. adrenaline going, right? You got adrenaline going. So you know, you know, my game plan. Because I played sports, I played athletics, and in business, I always had a game plan. Before I went, went into a call, I always had a game plan. What are we going to do, right? And my game plan was aisle up out. I just kept saying aisle up out. If I survive this thing, which was not a given, I had to have a game plan. And if I got that game plan, I went to the aisle, get up and get out. Okay, yeah, that's all good stuff. But then all of a sudden, you know, I get to the aisle, and that's when everything changed. Because when I got to the aisle. I heard my mom start talking to me and my mom passed away in 1997. But there was something I would hear in my back of my head that my mom would tell me when I was a child. It was, if you do the right thing, God will take care of you. And, you know, I tell people, after I thought about that for many years, my mom didn't say, do the right thing. My mom said, if you do the right thing. Mm -hmm. And one of the great things my mom did, and one of the things I think I'm not, I did not do as well as my mom and dad did as a parent. I'll give, and I'll tell you, you know, my mother and father made me make decisions when I was young. And had consequences. You know, I didn't do that for my kids. I think I, I did that some, but I think, I, I, you know, as parents, we try to protect our kids. Yes. But my mom said, if you do the right thing, God will take care of you. And it was my choice. Mm -hmm. You know, I could go out the plane. That would have been the right choice. But I made a decision to go towards the back of the plane because I knew that I was alive. I didn't know what was going on in the back of the plane, if, if anybody needed help. So I just climbed over the seats to get to the back of the plane. And the water was about chest level deep in the back of the plane already. Wow. But people were moving. Right. I mean, you're moving fast now. I mean, you're yeah. chest level, you got water chest level deep, bins are broken open, luggage is floating in the water as you're trying to get out. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's dark because you got to remember, this is late afternoon, New York winter. So it's dark. And so you're just sort of feeling your sort of feeling your way, excuse me, feeling your way out. Saw a light on the right. Like, I am out of here. Right. Time to get yep. out. And then I look out and the boat and wing, the little lifeboat and the wing were all filled up. So there's no room. So that's why I was inside the plane holding on to that lifeboat. So they were close to the wing for about seven minutes, waist deep in 36 degree water. And that's when, uh, you know, that's when things start happening and things start moving pretty quickly. When, when we talk about this common confidence, right? So you were able to remain calm enough to, to get to that back of that plane. So, and I know that, you know, you're working with other organizations to kind of take your lessons and kind of transfer that. So to keep that calm and confidence, which what we kind of talk about, yeah. uh, you didn't have the airline training, but you had your mom's lessons, you've had life training. And what was, what was the, uh, outside of your, your, your mom's lesson, how did you remain that, that calmness to be able to get to the back of the plane? Good question. And one of the things I share with people is one of the blessings that I've had in my life is I had the opportunity uh, for many years to be the head of security for a guy by the name of Tony Robbins. And, you know, I was with Tony and, you know, he, he, he was sort of my mentor. He wasn't, I guess, my official mentor, but he was giving me, being around him, you just that energy. Mm. You learn, right? You just yeah. learn by osmosis, right? And one of the things, one of the first things he teaches, if you go to any Tony Robbins book, and he talks about state management, how to manage your mind when all stuff's breaking loose, right? How do you manage mm -hmm. your mind? So I knew the three ways to manage my mind. And it's through your physiology, the questions you ask yourself, or what you focus on. And so on that day, I had, it was, to me, the way I managed my mind was basically asking myself questions. If, you know, if I get down, what am I going to do? What's my game plan? So I started, mm -hmm. I started managing my mindset through the questions I ask myself. And I also did the same thing with other passengers. When I had to get somebody's attention, I had to use, I had some of the questions and some things I had to do. So it really came down to a lot of the lessons I learned and training that I had just by being head of security for Tony and having to use those skills in that position and in my sales position. I mean, if you mm -hmm. get in a sales meeting and you're, sometimes you got to manage other people's states. You got to be able to make sure they're, they're locked in. So you got to be able to use these skill sets and, you know, focus, asking questions and physiology the three ways. So that's how I managed my mind. And you're right. I didn't have any training because one of the insights that no one talks about, but is a fact. And if you saw the movie Sully, they actually showed it, but you, unless you were looking for it, you didn't recognize mm -hmm. it. And it's true. All the crew went out the left side of the plane. So the right side of the plane had to be managed by passengers, led by passengers who had yeah. zero training, huh. who had zero instruction, right? But what you find out is when you go through something like this or anything, I mean, major, you don't have to know everything about everything. 
No. But you be have to you have to be able to lead yourself first and then lead other people. And that's what happened on the right side of the plate. You had leaders that stepped up who could lead in time of a crisis, who kept their heads, to help other people keep their heads. Mm. And I think that I mean, this is my personal opinion. Uh, I think it's validated. And but you know, I think when you know, I didn't know how to manage this, manage a door. I didn't know how to get the dang boat out, right? I mean, all these things. I, I, there's a brochure there, but I don't need the brochure because <laughs> I know everything, right? You fly, you know everything until you realize you know nothing, right? Absolutely. But if you can manage your mind and you can lead yourself and lead other people, everything else starts, starts coalescing. And that's how I think doing the right thing. You know, my mother said, "If you do the right thing, I think that was the right thing." I managed my mind. I kept my, myself under control. I love how you tie the great lessons from your mother yeah. and Tony Robbins, and it kind of just all comes together. Uh, that's, that's why my first book's called Moments Matter, because what you realize is all the moments in your life were there for a reason. Mm -hmm. And you may just go through life thinking this stuff happens. Everything happens for a reason. All those bad things happen for a reason, right? All those good things happen. If you don't learn something from it, then when that time comes, and I tell you what, Trevor, it will come. I yeah. don't care who you are. You could be the queen of queen of England. You could be the lowest janitor on the totem pole. Something in life's going to happen, right? True. Something's going to happen. Truth. And let's look what's going on right now in England. You know, King. You know, King Charles. He's got cancer. Mm. Who ever thought he would have cancer? He's only been king for what a year and a half. Yeah. Right. I mean, stuff that always happens, know. right? You've got to be able to. Have, so this is why I tell people, you know, that's why I, I coach people and show people how to how do you manage your mind when all stuff's breaking loose. And you have the extreme example where you could have lost all these lives and for you're all meant to be here for a reason. Right. It's it's important that right. how this happened and and that you're here just like the other passengers are here. And yes, it was an extreme event, but we go through micro events in manufacturing. Which seem, right. when, and after spending 25 years in manufacturing, I remember like people saying like, it sounds like you're saving lives because I make it so dramatic, right? Yep. And my emotion puts more meaning into that, right? And and then that's my whole mindset. So I kind of had had to work on that and figure out to say, how how am I approaching that situation? And when I think of now, and when I'm on the planes now, like since, uh, especially since Hugh introduced me to you and I've been listening to more of your talks and it's like, yeah, I listen to the airlines, you know, like I'm paying attention. Like yeah. I want to be ready for every moment. I, I, I want to, you know, take in each person that touches my life. Right. And, and it's kind of like, Hey, I ran into you for a reason and everybody's got this value. And in manufacturing, yes, we're coming to the same building every day, but every day is different. Um, talk to me a little bit about this whole, uh, cause I'm, I'm, I'm taking some of the material that I've learned from you about the emotion and the meaning. You want to say a yeah. little more on that, Dave? Yeah. And you know, and I, that's why I did my Ted talk because you know, when I got in, I, I wasn't going to do a Ted talk until I got interviewed by somebody for, for their magazine, AARP magazine. They were asking me, how did I grow out of this while other people went a different direction? Mm -hmm. Say it that way. Maybe yes. not full PTSD, but maybe some depression. And I started sharing the strategies that I did. And one of the things is that, you know, this is about the meaning I attached to it. And I used an example of what happened in the green room of Good Morning America. But and what happened was we were in the green room of Good Morning America about four or five weeks after this. We get interviewed, doing all those interview stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the passengers got extremely emotional. And, you know, at first I'm thinking, you know, what's wrong with this guy? And we're on national TV and we survived yeah. the plane crash. I'm like, oh, all this stuff. And all of a sudden I realized the meaning he attached that incident because what I found out, and this is why you learn not to judge people. What I found out is he was going through a divorce and he lost his job right after the miracle of Hudson. Mm -hmm. So the meaning he attached to the plane crash was devastation, devastated his life. Yes. The meaning I attached, it was a blessing because it opened up opportunities for me to show people how to create opportunity out of uncertainty. So the meaning you attach to something produces the emotion in your life and emotion is your life. Yes. And that's why I talked about that in my TED talk because whatever meaning you attach is that's where your emotion is going to go. And there's, you know, and people say, well, how do you change that? Well, there's, you know, how you change it is how you reframe that meaning. And there's a lot of ways to reframe and asking questions is one of the ways you reframe. But that's one of the things I do, Trevor, is I help people when they're in, when they're going through that challenging time, reframe the meaning. Because that's where, that's where it all starts, state management and how you frame meaning. Well, I've already used some of your lessons this week, Dave. <laughs> yeah. It's a short week, too. We have we own it on Monday right now. So, yeah. <laughs> that, that, that's yeah. how impactful it is. And yeah. I'm not making this up. But just, you know, interacting with this one client. And I'm a little bit uh, uncomfortable just because of kind of the way that it's going. Because I'm used to people liking me and it, everything kind of goes pretty well. Yeah. And then it's like, oh, yeah. 
not everything's going to be easy, Trevor, and not everyone's going to like you and it's not always going to work out. So what meaning are you putting towards it, right? Why is this a gift, right? And what what is this teaching me that maybe I need to shift my mindset in service of the other person? So I don't want to jump over the fact, Dave, that you talked about judgment. And what I talk about too is curiosity in others, because it's at those micro moments and, and you caught one just a couple of weeks after. And that really helped your ability to be less judgmental, catching you yourself in that situation. Uh, so it's really hard in manufacturing because we have, we depend on other people and our, it seems like our brains are hardwired just to think about why that person didn't finish that task they were responsible for. Uh, so how are you helping others not be so judgmental and taking what you learn from that curiosity moment? Yeah, thank you. It's um, with, That's an interesting distinction because you're exactly right. When I was in manufacturing, I, my manufacturing career actually started in the plant on third shift on graveyard shift making brake shoes. Oh, and then making, and then I worked for Rubbermaid making trash cans. And you're right. I mean, uh, you know, you're in the, in the plan is like, why did this person fill this, this container up? Why, why did, why, why don't people just do what they're supposed to do? And you get all <laughs> yes. frustrated, right? Yeah. Right. But, the, but then you don't know what they've been going through. Mm -hmm. And then that, you know, I wish I knew that 40 years ago. Right. But sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, you have to have these circumstances come in front of you to realize, you know, that, Hey, you know, this person's got a backstory. And I think that's why I tell people I love Marvel movies. Because mm. on, on all the Marvel movies, they'll show you the character, but then they'll go to the backstory, how they became who they are. Then you understand their mindset, right, on how they approach problems. Yeah. So, so, you know, that, that distinction came out of that circumstance. So when I was in business, it gave me a great distinction because, you know, there are a lot of times where I judge my client or potential client. Mm -hmm. Right. And they judge, they were probably judging me likewise. Right. <laughs> and I was like, you know what? So I, I ask a different question. It just comes back to that. So what if? I don't, I don't judge anything right now until I know their backstory. And then once I know their backstory, that'll give me some perspective on where they're coming from. How could that change my direction of my life? How, I used to ask that question. And all of a sudden, I did that in business. So I got very curious. I'd ask mm. people, I mean, you know, and I live down south, right? <laughs> I, I, in, in my blog today, I write about a, a circumstance. My, my, one of my first sales calls down in South Carolina was with the state comptroller of South Carolina. Gentleman, 65, 70 years old, had, had control of all the state money. All right. Okay. He wrote the checks. Uh, so what are the sales? What do you look for? The guy <laughs> that writes the checks. Heck yeah. So here I am at 26 and with a 65, 70 year old guy. And, you know, we're, we're shooting the breeze. Right. And all of a sudden I asked a direct question and I look at it. I was like, uh oh, right. <laughs> asked a direct question. And Trevor, he looked at me and this is, this is the lesson. This is, I'm getting to the lesson. He looked at me and said, you know what? I'm fixing to get started thinking about doing something like that. I said, mm. fixing to get ready to start thinking about doing something. I said, we're 20 years <laughs> away, aren't we? He goes, son, you don't have no clue. He said, you don't. And that's the way I realized. We talk about, off, off, see, I call AI authentic interaction. Mm. People have AI, they talk about AI. I think it's important to understand how it works. But the real AI is authentic interaction. Mm. But then there's the opposite, like everything else. You have one side, you have the other side. Yeah. And in that circumstance, Trevor, this is where I started having to figure out I have to be more curious. Yeah. It's because I was what I was focused on, and I'm looking back on this 40 some years ago now, almost almost 40 years ago, mm -hmm. 38 years. I was going for what's called accelerated intimacy. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to be his friend so bad and so quick, I just jumped yeah. before I got to know their backstory. Yeah. So I what I, I coach people on now and teach when I speak how to have authentic interactions instead of having the other AI accelerated intimacy. And watch what happens. So mm -hmm. many young people go, and this is a TikTok world, right? It's, I mean, yes. I'm not, hey, they're the smartest people in the world, but they, they want that intimacy right now. So they try to accelerate any way they can. They don't have authenticity. That's why it's so short term. Authentic yeah. interactions will last for years. Accelerated so intimacy easier. lasts for a, a transaction. So that's that was a distinction I learned way back in what, you know, 1988. And, you know, <laughs> and it sort of kicked my butt. And I started realizing, you know, years later, it's like, that's why that happened. Yeah. Right. That's why that happened. I thought, yeah. you know, I was going for accelerate instead of authentic. I love how the AI, the authentic interaction and just funny, because yeah, how I started the broadcast is that I I learned more about Miracle on the Hudson once we started doing this emotional intelligence work. And that's we tie that into the authenticity model. And here you are, you know, yep. expanding on that from the actual experience of if we can take a little pressure off ourselves and kind of comes back to that calm and confidence of just like be who you are and, right. and do it with kindness and and what's your mindset going into it. And when I look at if I zoom out and I look at manufacturing leadership, like where is it going? Right now we're recording this in 2024. And what I was used to and what I what I grew up with was 
fair is like doing it the same for everybody, right? Just be consistent, follow the rules, and you don't want to kind of bend and you don't want to be inconsistent, which I understand. But then as younger leaders, sometimes it's like, okay, well then treat everybody the same and just be the same and it'll all work out. But that's, I see it shifting, Dave, in the fact of like, we've got to navigate individuals and understand what's, like you said, what's their backstory, right? Because you can't approach everybody the same anymore, right? You need that curiosity and you got to have more conversations and get to know that person and that uh, authentic interaction. So is that what, are you seeing that across other industries as well, Dave? Yeah, I appreciate that, you know, bringing that up because, you know, at the 15th anniversary of the Miracle on the Hudson, I held an event in New York City for all the first responders. And one of the things I I started speaking about after, I, I mean, I was, I mean, Trevor, I had my notes. I knew I was going to say, right, yeah. I'm in front of all these first responding units, all this mm-hmm. media, right, in New mm-hmm. York City, the biggest stage in the world, New York City, right? Nice. And I had, and all of a sudden I shifted my notes because it's like, you know, I said, you know what? I said, what I see, one of the greatest strengths of that situation, and it was about the power of unity and diversity. Because all these diverse people who came together who did not know each other, who care about each other, if you all saw that movie, the common mission was stated, no one dies today. Mm-hmm. So when so there's a power in unity in, in in diversity. But then I start thinking about that. Do companies? And I mean, I was in manufacturing and distribution and retail for many years, right? Yeah. And you're right. I mean, and HR talks about diversity, diversity, diversity. Mm-hmm. See, what I think I with manufacturing, especially, but other, especially every organization, but manufacturing, what they're really looking for is not diversity. It's about inclusion. Mm. They want to include people. It's not about how many people you have with different colors and all work and all these check marks about how do you include people in the mission? And I think that's what people are looking for. So I think the power of unity of that day was in the power of inclusion, yes. how everybody was included and everybody got recognized for the contribution they made. And that is when you get curious, understand somebody's backstory. They, what people really want, there's six things people really want or have. Okay. There's one that they really want. And those six things are People need to need have the need for certainty in their life. They yes. want to be certain, but they also want to have some variety because you get too much certainty and all of a sudden <laughs> you need to spice things up, right? So sometimes <laughs> you'll act out in a manufacturing plant just so they can get, get some feedback. Yeah. The third is connection. People yes. want that connection. And that's what was missing during COVID. They didn't have that connection. Mm-hmm. I mean, we had a Zoom, but it wasn't connected. And the fourth is what really drives a lot of salespeople or leaders, significance. You know, I, I'm the one making a call. And that's what happens a lot of time. I'm the foreman. I make the call. This is how we're going to do it. Right. But the fifth one is about how can we contribute? I need to have the need for contribute, be able to contribute. And the sixth is the need for growth. And the thing, if you look at all how this all comes together, everybody's got all these together. Mm -hmm. But especially in in business, when I find everybody's got, but they have one of those are called primary that when all stuff's breaking loose. Mm -hmm. All right. When mm-hmm. you get stressed, one of them is going to shine, right? Yeah. One, well, that's what's called your primary because that's where you're going to always fall back on. And if you're in leadership, like in a manufacturing, if you're in middle management, it's all about managing. Yeah. It's not about leading; it's about managing. Yeah, right. You get stuck in that. You get stuck, and the difference in that is a lesson I learned from some Schwarzkopf. I was with General Norman Schwarzkopf many moons ago. I had to escort him. He, and he talked about a lot of things. One of the things he talked about, and I share this lesson. So it's not my. I learned it from Schwarzkopf. Mm-hmm. Is you know. Five plus 15 is better than 15 plus five. And what that means is this. It's a difference between a leader and a manager. Mm-hmm. A manager will do this. They have a project. They've got, they've got, we've got to get 10,000 widgets out by on some first shift. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. And so a manager will do this. We got to get 10,000 widgets out. This is how I want you to do it. This is what I want you, 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 and you to do. Right. And this is well, how we're going to do it. All right. I'll give you five minutes to figure out how we're going to, how you're going to do it. Or a leader will do this. Trevor, we got 10,000 widgets to get out. If you have questions, ask me, but it's your job. Yeah. Get them out. Yeah. Autonomy. Right? So, yeah. So a leader will give you the mission. You can ask me anything you want. I will answer anything you want. But a manager will tell you how to do it, how, when they want to do it, how they want to do it, who they want to do it with, <laughs> because they want to control it. And oh. that's what happens a lot of time in manufacturing plants. Yeah. Did you get those middle managers who want to control because they think they're getting judged? Yeah. Leaders want results. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so- Getting curious means this, you know, you got to figure a different, I mean, even, I mean, the three things that companies are looking for in all their associates. I mean, this is, I talk about this in leadership all the time. First thing is they're looking for somebody who has confidence in their position. They can do it. Second yeah. thing is do they have a competence. Are they able to do it? Yeah. But third is what the, the difference is. This is what leaders are looking for and how you can accelerate and really and go up the ladder. They're looking for the third C. 
somebody who has creativity. They take the miracle on the Hudson. The captain and crew, listen, you got a plane that's going down, right? The, and I saw it in the movie. The stated game plan is you go back to the airport, right? Well, you know, he had four, four choices. <laughs> go to the airport, not a good option. Can't get there. No. The ocean's right there, right? Yeah. Not good. Third, and there's an airport right here in Teterboro. Too many big buildings. Fourth, mm. there's a river. You got to get really creative, right? If you're a leader, you got to be creative, and you're looking for people who are going to give me creative solutions. So in manufacturing, the way I always succeeded when I was in the manufacturing world, especially in technology and manufacturing, I would bring people, so, I'd give them confidence that I could do it. I showed them how I could do it, and I'd give them a creative idea that no one would ever talk about before. And the way I did that was to... Basically, for the first time, I was in a company working for a company by working with a company by the name of Coca Cola in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Trevor, I was out of the game. I was out of the game, right? I was following yeah. our company's playbook yeah. until one day I said, We're going to lose, right? We're going to lose. So, quickly, what happened was I had to get creative. And how I got creative is I had to figure out because I don't know if you ever worked with a Coca Cola or a Walmart. No. These are gigantic companies, right? I had to understand how did they buy? How did they make decisions? Mm. What's the protocol? So what I did is I went out on my uh, on a hanger right out there on the ledge, <laughs> and I got a, a, I hired an attorney who used to work I was on the legal team of Coca Cola. Yeah, could tell me the inside of how do these people do this. So I gave our team a creative solution on how to do this project and manufacturing and Coca Cola. It was really more distribution at that point. But all of a sudden, I opened up. We opened up not I, but we, we as a team. Oh, a whole new relationship with Coca Cola by just being able to be creative. So I, that's a long winded answer, but. You know, being curious and being creative, that's what people are looking for you to bring them right now. That's what happened that day on the Hudson. That's what happened that day in the plane. And that's that's how, you know, you create opportunity out of uncertainty. I love I love how you tied everything in together. Your leadership lessons to the Hudson, Miracle on the Hudson, to just manufacturing. And I, and I yep. love how you're able to connect that and, and simplify that for me, Dave. And just kind of, you know, I, I know the listeners are going to be thinking because you got me thinking and, yeah. you know, that's what makes us better, right? Just kind of thinking of like, how do I, how do I reframe that? And when I look at safety in manufacturing, you know, it's kind of the same as, you know, what was your mission for landing that plane, right? Uh, that everyone's yeah. going to be alive and manufacturing. I, I see the difference in the safety culture, just in the mindset of like, is our biggest focus that everyone goes home safe today? Yep. And does, does everyone feel creative to build off you? Right. And, you know, where is everything going? Everyone's got to be creative in order for no one to go home hurt ever. Right. And that's very possible. And it's happening today in some plants. And I think the more that they can hear your message, Dave, and, and think a little bit differently, then we can have safer plants, a better quality, more pro productivity, but the unity that you talked about in the beginning, I'll tie that back in, right? The unity that you guys had on that plane, we can have that every day in manufacturing. And I know it's the same plant sometimes that you're going yep. in, but it is a new day. There are new experiences. And if we can be a little less judgmental and a little more curious, and I love how you use the word connected. Yep. So, uh, so many more things I had to ask you, but we're, we're out of time. But what, what do you want to leave the listeners with when they think of Dave Sanderson, they're walking the plant today. What are they talking about? I will leave quick with a short story. Uh, I had the I had the opportunity and great privilege to speak at NASA's Safety Day a few mm. years ago, which was a for a kid who grew up in the '60s. Space was everything, man. It was the coolest thing. I wanted to be an astronaut, right? When I was a kid, I, yeah. I have in my little book. I want to be an astronaut, right? <laughs> so, but one of those things, as you as I negotiated that, when you older you get and you're not that old yet, Trevor, it's not as much about the money. It's about the mm -hmm. experience. Yes. So one of the experiences they gave me is to speak with a gentleman. There's a room at Cape Canaveral with the remains of the uh, Space Shuttle Columbia. Mm. Okay? And there's one guy who owns the key, owns the room. And he and I had an hour together. And he wanted to learn about America on the Hudson. I yeah. wanted to find out about this. <laughs> he said something. And this I want to leave this with your, with your team because this is exactly what you were talking about in manufacturing. He said, you know what? He goes, do you remember Apollo 1? I said, yeah. I don't know if you remember Apollo 1. Apollo 1 was the first Apollo where the three astronauts burned up in training. They all died. And he said, he said if Apollo 1 doesn't happen, we don't get to the moon. Hmm. And Trevor, I was like, I was like, flat. I was like, what are you talking about? He goes, listen, we got so casual. We were getting so much money. Everybody loved us. Yeah. And we got casual. He said, casualness leads to casualties. Hmm. And I thought, he said, he said, look, he said, look what happened. He said, we, you know, we got to the moon because if that happens out in space, we never, we're not even going to the moon. Right. Yes. Look what happened to the space shuttle, the O-ring. It got casual. 
Mm-hmm. Same thing happened. So and then I started thinking, you know what? Think about manufacturing plant. You get casual, all right? Yeah. Something bad can happen. Just think in the relationship. If you get you get sloppy, you get divorced. If you get if you get casual with your money, you go broke, right? If you get casual with your body, you die. So Cashless leads to casualties is something I learned at NASA on their safety day. That you can take any manufacturing plant, distribution plant, you can be casual. They're there, there are things there for a reason. And if you get casual, it can lead to somebody's casualty. It could mean an injury or even worse. Wow, man. If you're walking into the plant right now, and you just heard this, uh, you get so many different areas that we can take away from this. I know that you're going to be speaking close to my home hometown area of London, Ontario. You're going to be speaking to Hamilton. You're going to be speaking in Toronto. How is it best for the listeners to follow you? Well, thank you. I would love for them to check me out on LinkedIn at David Sanderson on LinkedIn because every week I drop new content in a blog. So they can get, so you can hear my latest and greatest the content. But uh, please check me out on my website, DaveSandersonSpeaks.com. And if you go there, check out, go to where it says books and magazines, and you can download a free copy of my magazine, Moments Matter, the magazine. I give that complimentary for anybody who goes on my website. Uh, every quarter I issue a new uh a new uh, edition, and this this edition right now is that uh, talks about uh, it's going to be addressed about you know how do you how what moment in your life helped define you who you are. So check it out, DaveSandersonSpeaks dot com. You can see me speak, and you can and you get my books, my three books, or just check out the magazine for free. Right on. I love it. Thank you so much for for being so thoughtful today, Dave, on just tying this into like for us in manufacturing and, and how that ties in and sharing your experience and, and taking the time and just just a pleasure to meet you. Thanks so much, Dave. Thank you very much, Trevor. Hey, folks, appreciate you taking the time to join us today. If you enjoyed this episode, share it with someone. Haven't subscribed yet? Do it now. Remember, If you want results, the key is increasing your awareness of how you show up.